this Sunday, or today, it is, it is, Mike Sebastian will be talking to us about dreams. It's subtitled A Snapshot of the Future. It includes how to use nighttime dreams for daily guidance and prophecy in our life, how to interpret dreams, how to remember our dreams and use dream tracking as a tool for spiritual evolution and unfoldment, how to program our dreams for solving our daily problems and dilemmas, how to use our dreams to catch a snapshot of our future and sidestep adversity before it blindsides us. The Reverend Dr. Michael Sebastian, um, he's been on several, many TV programs, a and &E, e, VH1, so forth. Uh, he's a longtime member of Ekinkar, and has authored several books on dreams, synchronicity, and quantum physics. He is co-founder of Divine Guidance Institute and Wellness Center. His tools and techniques provide a methodology for opening a window to personal transformation and spiritual unfoldment. Please welcome Michael. Mike Sebastian. A lot of dreamers here. How many remember the dreams from last night? Okay. There is an ancient way of knowing dreams, a snapshot of your future. Edgar Casey once said that dreams are the answers to tomorrow's questions. And I'll give you a little bit today. It's, it, actually, I'm going to try to compress 30 years of dream field research into the next 40 minutes. But I will give you something when you walk away can be absolutely transformational in your life today. And that's how to remember dreams, how to interpret dreams, and how to track your dreams. I was talking to my neighbor the other day and uh, we were talking about dreams We'll call him Jack. And Jack said, you know, the thing that I remember most about my dreams is when I was a little kid. I had a high fever. And while I had the fever, I had these flying dreams. You know, and he started doing this. You know, here's a grown man doing like an airplane. And you could, he, I could tell he went right back there. And it triggered something in me. It reminded me of one of the great benefits of dreams. That is, they allow us to leave the body and recognize ourselves as something more than just this, something spiritual, something energy. It allows us to contact that divine universal database that we all have access to. And that's really the goal of dreams. In other words, I get the question a lot, and it's a valid question from skeptics, like why should I pay attention to my dreams? Why do I really care? Why are dreams important? Well, how would you like your own personal <laughs> built-in guide, your own personal oracle? How would you like to get a snapshot of your future so you can sidestep adversity and not get blindsided every day? I get the question a lot. Mike, how do you know? I mean, I wish I knew career, relationship, finance, whether to sell the house, whether the house is going to sell, whether to move to a new city. We all struggle with those things. Well, what I have found over 30 years is that I'm already getting the answers to those questions in my dreams. But the problem is I don't remember my dreams, and if I do, they're all jumbled. They're upside down, they're scrambled, and I can't interpret the dreams. I'll give you a little bit of my journey and how I got into dreams. Rewind 20 years ago. And I'm a sociologist and I'm teaching, I've taught at six major universities. And I'm teaching at the University of Texas. And uh, one night, I, 20 years ago, I have a dream. And it's one of those real clear, lucid dreams. And in the dream, I'm in chemistry class and I'm sitting next to this Girl, hot girl, one of those dreams. I tried to go back into the dream, but I couldn't pull it. 
And her name's Nicole in the dream. And she's a personal fitness trainer. And she has uh, uh, blonde hair and brown eyes. And I wake up and it's so clear I journaled. Luckily, I journaled the dream in great detail. I put it aside. Fast forward five years. Five years later. Thank you. Five years later, I'm teaching sociology again at the University of Texas. And who walks into the class and sits, thank you, and sits in the front row, none other than the dream girl, Nicole. Well, you know, I'd like to say I remember the dream, but hey, give me a break. It's been five years. We all have trouble remembering dreams from last week. So the semester goes by. Semester ends. I really don't. It's a big class. There's like 100 students in the class. And um, several months later, I heard somebody yell my name, Sebastian. Hey, Sebastian. And it was Nicole on campus. And she came up and she said, Hey, I'd like to uh, take you out to lunch. And I thought, Well, okay, because students usually want letter of reference for graduate school or whatever. So we go to lunch. And we're sitting there. And I said, So what can I do for you? And she said, Well, I was thinking we might date. <laughs> and I, I went silent. Like it took me, I, I looked at her. And I thought I misunderstood her. I thought, date, date. Um, and at the time she was like 24, I was just turning 50. So there was a tremendous age spread. And then she, she said the right thing. She went, what do you got to lose? I thought, wow, well, that's a good philosophy. A week, a month, who knows where I'll go. So we started dating. And uh, within three months, we were engaged. Within nine months, we were married. It's been 15 years we're married. And we're both dream therapists. This is our business. We go around, we speak, and uh, we assist people like veterans with PTSD and uh, people who are addicted to heroin and every other thing on the planet. They have nowhere else, else to turn. We use dream therapy really to assist them. Um, the interesting part was that later on, I started getting that deja vu feeling, that flashback, like, wow, I've been here before. And Nicole was getting ready to take her certification exams for being a fitness trainer. Well, in the dream, she was a fitness trainer, and her name was Nicole. Boom, that's when it flashed in. I thought, oh my God, I had a dream of you five years ago. I actually went and I found, I found that dream in a journal. I always keep my old dream journals. And it was stunning for me. It was a turnaround. It let me know that all the important events in my life, I've had dreams, I've had flashes of where I'm going to go and, and really what it's going to look like. And it was interesting because her part of the story is she said, you know, this is two years after we were married. She said, after that first class, I ran home and told my roommate, Heather, I'm going to marry that guy. Good thing she didn't tell me then. I would have had her arrested as a stalker. <laughs> but dreams are, uh, they are prophetic. And the reason that I figured out I don't pick up on it is when they occur, they're of the future. So they're meaningless. I mean, there's a stranger, a girl, and it, it, it was meaningless. I didn't know a Nicole. That was just a stranger. However, as I've started tracking my dreams, writing them down, I call them dreams tracking, I was able to connect the dots. When I look back and review the dreams once a month or even once a quarter, I'm able to see all the different events and how the dreams were really showing me and giving me answers to the questions that I was asking on a daily basis. Guidance. And dreams are really about, like the goal of dreams, knowingness, gnosis. And uh, Michael Warren covered that. Michael, thank you for that, uh, last week. And that's what the Gnostic creed was. Their credo was to know through experience, to go within. Gnosis, to know. And if you asked a Gnostic, do you believe in God? The Gnostic would say no. Because I've asked the wrong question. I need to ask smarter questions. 
better question would be, do you know there's a God? And the Gnostic would say, of course. And if you ask them, how do you know? They'd say, because I've experienced it. I've been there. There's the knowing and the doing. I mean, the, the, the knowing is the knowledge, and the wisdom is the doing. So they're different. As we begin to experience it, it becomes wisdom for us. And that's what happens with dreams. They take us to a higher state of consciousness and allow us to access a database within each and every one of us that expands our awareness. Many years ago, when we first started doing this, my wife and I, we went into a called Dell. We were in Austin, Texas. I was still teaching a called Dell computer because they're based in Austin. And I asked them if we could come in and speak on spirituality and dream. I didn't expect a yes. And for whatever reason, HR said, yeah, come on in. So we went in. We were doing a presentation. And uh, I mean, five or ten minutes into the presentation, all these techies are in there. And they're kind of talking to each other. And there's all kinds of noise. And finally, I just went, bam. I hit that. And everybody jumped. And it was dead silence. And I said, you know, there's a universal database, and we're all little PCs. And today, and today, we're going to teach you as a PC how to connect into that database and download everything you need. And everybody's like, oh man, that was it. Speak the lingo. What's, what's unique about dreams that most people I think don't realize that I've found over 30 years is we teach people how to interpret their dreams, how to remember their dreams. When we first started, we used to interpret dreams for people. Pretty soon we had a thousand emails, people calling in the middle of the night, Mike! So we taught them how to do their own dreams. And, and what's, what's unique is the symbols. They are unique to us. So if I dream about water, and you dream about water, but I almost drowned last week in Lake Chapala, it's going to be a symbol of fear, and dread. For you, it might be universal oneness and cleansing and purity. If I dream of a, a snake and I almost got bit by a rattler last week, it'll be a fear once again. If you have a pet snake, it'll be one of love. So each symbol is specific to the dreamer. There are no dream dictionaries that really work. I started many years ago using a dream dictionary, but I only used it for a few weeks many, many years ago and got rid of it. So the way to figure your dreams out, I'm going to give you a technique today. You won't need any pencil or paper, but it's a one-minute technique and it works 90% of the time. It's quick and it's fast and it's accurate. It's been field tested. When I say field tested, I started studying dreams with you know the classical Freud, Jung, and Adler read it all and took it into the classroom at the university and called it the Sociology of Dreams. And the students used to say, where is that in the book, uh, Mr. Sebastian? And I, I'd say, nah, it's advanced stuff. It's way beyond the book. And I, and I taught it because it taught me how to use it. And it, whenever I used to get to the Sociology of Religion, which is part of sociology, the students, you do this collective groan, oh. and I'd say, what? What? And they go, boring, boring. And it was boring. Belief systems and, and Christianity and Islam and Judaism. So I started going into the religions and researching dreams. And I found that every single religion, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, the Vedas, the Torah, the Bible, every sacred book on the planet emphasizes dreams and goes into dreams and talks about how important they are and how we can use them for healing, for expanded states of consciousness, and for contacting that higher, that higher self within each of us. About a year ago, we got a call, to give you a, a snapshot of your future. Got a call from a, a guy from Dallas. He's 24, 25, young guy. And um, he was doing really well. And he, we said, you know, how can we help you? And he wanted to do two or three dream sessions. They're an hour each. And he found us on the web. And I always screen the people because I said, well, what do you want to focus on? Career, finance, relationship? Most people who call us, their lives are upside down. Their spouse is cheating on them. And they're wondering, you know, what to do. 
or they think their spouse is cheating on them. How many have had cheating dreams? Come on now, guys. That's right. You're in denial, all right? You're in denial. Because we get it a lot. I can't tell you how many people come to me and they go, well, you know, what's it mean that I dream my spouse is cheating? And you know, I tell them, well, what you should do is check their emails and their cell phones, all right? But the truth is, cheating dreams usually mean we're cheating ourselves out of something. That's all. We are cheating ourselves out of something. Um, every once in a while, it will be literal. Someone is cheating. Because I, I, I'll ask the uh, client, you got any gut feeling on this? And they go, yeah, I have had a gut feeling for a year, but absolutely no proof. My mate is so loving. And then they're having cheating dreams. Well, that's two prongs of the confirmation right there. So there's probably a really good chance they might be cheating. Anyway, this guy calls from Dallas, and he wants to do a couple sessions. So I'm screening him, and everything's great in his life. He just got married. He's already making tons of money. He went to Harvard Business School, and he just wants to talk about dreams. And I said, that doesn't fit. I said, why do you want to talk about dreams? It doesn't seem to fit with the scenario of your life. And he said, well, I'll tell you a story. He said, many, many years ago, well, maybe eight or ten years ago, he said, I had a dream. And in the dream, it was clear, and there were a string of numbers, six numbers. And he said, so um, I woke up, and I jotted the numbers down in the sequence from the dream. And I called one of my friends, and I said, well, you know, what do you think this is, a telephone number address or what? My friend said, well, it's probably a lottery number. You're going to hit the lottery. And, and this guy doesn't play, he doesn't play the lottery. And so he thought about it. He did check the lottery numbers that night, and it was the lottery number for like $100 million in that sequence, the exact numbers. He said, that's why I'm talking to you. I said, wow, were you, oh, were you devastated? Or He goes, no, not at all. He said, I'm not a gambler. He said, I really don't care about the money. He said, I'm making good money. He said, I saw that as the greatest gift I'd ever been given. He said, it let me know how important dreams are. He said, that couldn't be coincidence. He said, I know they're important. He said, that's why I called you guys. So, um, we've run into many, many clients who have used their dreams as a, uh, as a way to get a snapshot of the future as a way to get guide, guidance on a daily basis. We had one client come to us, and uh, we'd only spent maybe a minute talking with her. And we asked her, one of the questions we asked her, well, do you remember your dreams you want to tell us about? Them? And she said, well, I have had one recurring dream for the last five years. And we said, well, what's that? She said, my teeth are falling out. How many have had teeth falling out? Dream. All right, here you go. And um, so, and she said it's very vivid and it keeps recurring. And she said, what could that be? And, you know, Nicole and I looked at each other and we said probably communication problems, communication issues. When your teeth are falling out, it's a communication issue. Either you're holding everything within and you're not speaking as to what you need in life, as to what you want in your career, your relationship, whatever, or you're speaking too much and the dream's telling you, you know, curb it. And she busts out laughing when we said communication issue. She said, oh my God, how long we been here? 60 seconds, one minute? And she said, I've been in therapy for 10 years, probably $25,000, and you know what my therapist told me last week? You got a communication issue. <laughs> and it took 60 seconds with the dream. And it's nothing we do. We're just the messengers. The tools I'm going to share with you today, having to do with dreams, are ancient. They go back, I tracked them back 5,000 years over the last 30 years. And found dreams just about everywhere. I mean, dreams the Greeks and the, and the Chinese and the Babylonians and the Chaldeans and the Egyptians, and they all study dreams, and they all use dreams on a daily basis. Uh, the pharaohs use them, generals use them, Alexander the Great used it, Julius Caesar had their dream dudes, dream advisors.
They had their sign people, homonologists. You know, sire, there's an eagle flying in the sky on the day of battle, which is a good sign, but if that eagle drops from the sky, huh, put the battle on hold for that day. All these things I have found are connected, which is why it's led me to where I am in my career with dreams. In other words, there's some quantum physics, and uh, Jim mentioned that I've done some things with quantum. And Jung did a lot with dreams and synchronicities, but he didn't have the advantage of quantum. Quantum was around at the time, but he died, I think, in like 1961. And if he had quantum, he would have taken the dream study and the synchronicities a lot further than he did. He would have seen that quantum has proven that everything is connected. Everything is connected in the whole universe. There's nothing that's not connected. So if we even have a thought, it affects everything all the way out to Alpha Centauri 2 and to the end of the universe. Which means our dream life and our waking life is connected. So, all we need to do really is connect the dots. Just connect the dots. One lady came to us and she had a health issue. And she'd been sick for four or five years. And it was getting worse. And she'd been to every major doc. And they'd run the MRIs and every test they had and they couldn't find anything. And she's dying. So we started analyzing her dreams. You know, what kind of dreams you got? Which, what are the recurring ones? And we did the techniques. And one dream she was having, there were some initials in the dream that kept occurring through all her dreams. And the initials were PB. You know, so I knew it was important, but hell, I don't know what PB is any more than she does. And so we're working on it. And I say, you know, do you know anybody named, you know, like Patty Benson or, or Pete Bronson? Or, and she's going, no, no, um, PB. How about peanut butter? Does that mean no? <laughs> so we're sitting there trying to figure out, because of the health issue, I figure it's related. Something she needs to know that nobody's found out through all the tests. And that little voice intuitively in my head said, try Googling it. So, hey, I turned around to the computer. I said, let's put it in and see what we get. PB. A lot of stuff on PB, you can imagine. And I'm reading some of the stuff to her, and I said, well, I said, hey, it says PB is the chemical symbol for lead. I said, does, uh, I said, you ever been tested for lead toxicity? She said, no, hell no. She said, but I'm going to the lab in two weeks and back to the doc. They tested her. Bingo. She was dying from, from lead poisoning. It was severe. The dream saved her life. The dream saved her life. It opened that window. The dream had been given her the solution to what she was looking for five years before she, she started getting sick. And that's pretty much how it works. When we have a dream, I've always found it shows you the problem and it'll give you the solution. It will show you the problem, and it will give you the solution. And uh, I've been working with dreams on and off and having the prophetic dreams. And at some point, I was standing in a uh, bookstore in Minneapolis one day, and I was just finished reading one book and getting ready to put it back. There was nobody around, and this one book just kind of boop, jumped, jumped right off the shelf and fell on the floor. So before I left, I picked it up and uh, put the book back. But as I did, I realized it was a book on dreams and soul travel. It was by Akinkar. And I'd already been interested in dreams. And so I saw that as, as a sign. And Akinkar, I ended up joining Akinkar. I've been in Akinkar for 20 years, and they used dreams as a way of expanded states of consciousness and soul travel, which is an advanced form of dreaming, conscious dreaming, really. It's like flying. When we have a dream of flying, it really means that we're conscious of dreaming and we're out of the body. It lets us know that we can escape this body temporarily till we have to come back to it. And there are some universal symbols. We'll have fun with them for a minute here, like uh, how many of you have dreamed that uh, 
or you feel like you start to drift off, or maybe you're taking that, you jerk awake suddenly like that, like, whoa, like you stepped off a cliff. That's, um, that occurs when we, when we sleep, we dream. When we dream, we actually leave the body in energy form. When we sleep, we dream, we leave the body in energy form. When we start to leave the body in a dream, we start to doze off and we snap back. What happens is we've changed our mind or through fear we've come back into the body. As soon as we come back into the body, we come with a very hard landing. Also, you may be dreaming at night and suddenly just boom, you wake up like that. That's another hard landing. You're coming, you're coming back into the body in spirit form. How about a frozen dream? Who's had a frozen dream? You can't move. They're a little bit scary. What happens is in a frozen dream, we are not quite aligned. When we come back in, it's a mechanical thing. You got to align, boom, and you wake up. Consciousness. We're going from dream state of consciousness to this state of consciousness. It's just shifting gears, nothing more. Different states of consciousness. If we're not totally back in this state of consciousness, we get misaligned, we feel frozen, we're kind of aware that we're awake, but we can't wake up, we can't move. The solution to it is simply relax. And when we relax, um, we automatically wake up. Naked dreams, how many of that naked dreams? See that? That's up here, guys. Run down to Karatara, naked. <laughs> No, maybe we need to erase that. All right. That just means exposed. We're feeling exposed in some uh, exposed in some area of our life, and we've all had those dreams. Sex dreams. And I've had a lot of clients say, "Oh my God, I had a dream of having sex with my mom or dad, and it was really gross." And what's you know? And it's not a Freudian thing at all. Sex dreams simply mean get comfortable or get close to that aspect of the person you're having sex with. They have something within them, maybe it's patience or love or compassion. It's showing you get intimate, include it in your personality, and you'll be a better person. It's really that simple. Um, there are some universal symbols, and they are um, recurring pretty much. What else? They, uh, they really run the gamut. Death dreams. It's really death something old and birth of something new. That's all. Um, tornadoes, hurricanes, disasters. Big change coming. Big change. Sometimes we'll find money. Doesn't mean you're going to hit the lottery. Money means like nickel, dime, quarter, or maybe pesos if the dream's in Spanish. It just means a small change coming into your life. Small change. If you find hundred-dollar bills in your dreams, it usually means big change coming into your life. These things tend to be uh, tend to be universal. Nightmares. How many suffer from nightmares here? Important message coming in. Important message. When we have a when we have a dream, if we don't get the message, it becomes a recurring dream. The recurring dream, if we don't get it and it's important, becomes a nightmare. And if we still don't get it, sometimes it becomes a night terror. We're literally in a cold sweat. We hate to close our eyes because we have those. Uh, I work with a lot of veterans, PTSD. I was a Vietnam veteran. I used to have flashbacks, PTSD. I find myself waking up locked and loaded, looking at the door. Um, I just went to supper with my ex-wife. She said, do you still have those dreams where I had to shake you and walk? talk you down because you're there with a gun facing the door. <clears throat> I said, no. One of the techniques uh, I'll share with you right now, we'll do it right now. It's good for remembering dreams. It's good for PTSD. It's good for stress, anxiety, insomnia. It will stop nightmares almost immediately. We use it with children who have night terrors. Nothing else works. Guaranteed, 100% of the time. Actually, you can use this technique. It's called a toning technique. This sound technique, you can use it for anything in your life to turn down the volume on the chaos and the fear and turn up the volume on inner peace and harmony. 
and it's called the hue, H-U, hue. Two letters. It's pronounced like the name hue, like Hugh Jackman or the pastel, hue. We use it with all our clients. Um, I came across it in my, my spiritual path, and I found that it works. With us, we take the best and leave the rest. And we, we work with people who, you know, they're on five drugs and addicted to heroin and getting a divorce and their life's upside down and they're suicidal. And with the hue, two years ago I got an email. I opened the email and it was from some guy. He's not our client. Don't know who it is. He lives up in the state of Washington. And um, he had found this because he was desperate. Found us on the web. And he was a veteran. PTSD. Suicidal. And he went in the email, he went into, if you're a counselor, you know, he, he asked two questions. Do they have a plan for killing themselves? Do they have a weapon? And if the answer is yes, yes, that's a red flag. You should get them help. Anyway, after reading the email, he was on the ragged edge. And Nicole read it. She said, yeah, guys, ready to pull the trigger. So, you know, what did, what did we have for him? Sent him an email with the cue outlining it. said, try this. And a week went by, maybe 10 days, and I got an email saying, oh my God, thank you for that. I feel hope for the first time in my whole life. And backed off of that ragged edge simply from sending him an email with you. Generally in those types of situations, that they, those people need to be in therapy for years. And the hue works instantly, and it allows you to breathe for a while while you get yourself together and take another step in a different direction. And I'll invite you to try it. If you don't feel comfortable, you can just listen. But if you'd like to hew along, then I'd like you to actually feel and experience the hew. And get comfortable and get both feet on the ground. And all you do is you take a deep breath, and then on the out breath, you hew, and I'll give you a demo first. It goes like this. And we'll do it for maybe 45 seconds, three or four views, and then you'll hear me say, okay, come on back. So take a deep breath. vibration shift. You can feel the harmonic. You can use the hue for remembering your dreams. If you don't remember your dreams, we were on uh, Coast to Coast, Art Bell, Nori, we've been on five times. They love the hue. This guy called in and he goes, I have not remembered a dream in 40 years. I do not dream. So we gave him the hue. A day later we got an email saying for the first time that night he remembered three dreams. So, just before you fall asleep, you're laying there, getting ready to go to sleep, just do softly or even silently in your head. And it, what it does, it gives you a remote. It reprograms the frequency or vibration that dreams come in on. It's simply quantum physics. When we chant or use a mantra like you, it reprograms us from the inside out. It goes to the source. It's a source code. That's why it actually heals instantly from the inside out. There'll be, a, there'll be a healing, and people feel better. They're whole. Sometimes the malady goes away. Sometimes it doesn't, but there's been a healing. That's because we've rechanneled and used the remote through that ancient toning technique, the hue. And the hue it can be found once again in all the sacred books. In the Bible, the Quran, 
the Vedas, the Torah, the Druids used it, Kabbalah uses it, the Gnostics used the hue, the Sufis used the hue, Rumi used the hue. When he used to do his spinning, whirling dervishes, you ever wonder what word they use when they spin? It's hue. Rumi talks about the hue. Uh, it's ancient. Good way to remember your dreams. That's all you need to do is lay down. If you want to program the dreams, all you do is think about what you want to dream about. And we do it inadvertently every night. We go, wow, I had a dream about that. And as I was laying there, I was thinking about that. I fell asleep, I had a dream about it. That's how we program our dreams. So, if, you know, if it's finances, career, just think about it. Cue for one minute, let it go. Do it for night one, two, three. You will have a dream showing you what you need to know. It'll lead you right down that path. Here's a quick technique, because we're getting short on time. And it's called T technique. It's as simple as it gets. T technique. And it's good for busting out dreams and figuring them out 90% of the time. The other 10%, you'll never know what they are. I have dreams I still haven't figured out, but that's how it rolls. Um, T technique, what, what it is, is a word association technique. You, on one side of the T, you put the symbol. On the other side, you put the meaning. And it's quick word association. Don't labor over it. Whatever it is, boat, snake, uh, running, chase. I had a dream that a large gorilla was chasing me with a candy cane, trying to kill me. And I woke up and I knew what it was. The gorilla represented the monkey on my back. The candy was killing me. I was eating so much sweets every day. The sugar was literally going to kill me. So the dream was showing me. Hey. So in, in the tea technique, I put the gorilla, I put chase, I put candy cane, I put fear. And at the bottom of the tea, it's real simple. That's all you got to do. Word association. Sketch it out. It takes one minute. You ask the question. At the bottom, what is going on in my life right now? Or, what was I thinking about yesterday? Because dreams are connected, like quantum says, to our waking reality. Everything's connected. We dream about the things we're wondering about. You want to trigger a dream? You know the old saying, just sleep on it? That's what we, Nicole and I have dream time. Every night we talk about our dreams that we had from the previous day. And uh, go through our dreams and, and analyze them. And when we analyze our dreams, it's like getting an MRI of our psyche. It's pure truth, pure truth coming in. And a lot of times the dreams will be jumbled and they'll be scrambled and they'll be upside down because there's a dream sensor. Fortunately or unfortunately, dreams, because people go, well, why don't they just come in clear? Well, they do, but they go through a sensor. It's like a movie sensor. And the sensor takes a look at it to see if it's too much of a jolt to our fragile ego and reality. So suddenly we'll have a dream about a stranger doing something, violence, and you'll go, oh, that wasn't me. Actually, it is probably. <laughs> but the, the dream is, is showing it in a different context. It removes it one or two steps and it scrambles it. The sensor will do that. But what will happen is if you start working with your dreams, You'll be able to figure them out, and you'll be able to get around the sensor. A good way to get around the sensor is just ask the question, what would my dream look like if it weren't scrambled? And suddenly, it's, it's like a little word jump. Whoop, you'll look at it and go, well, there it is, T technique. Use the hue to remember your dreams, also for stress, anxiety, insomnia, nightmares, depression, suicidal thoughts. It'll bring you right back to the present moment and give you that feeling of peace and inner harmony. And um, maybe we have time to take some questions. Do we do? Uh, in terms of the teeth technique, what do you do with, um, I get the images, but what about a feeling or you shift consciousness or you put that down on that side where you would put it? Yes, at the bottom you would put the feeling. You would put what is going on in my life right now so it's connected, and you would definitely put the feeling of the dream because the feeling is important, joy, love, 
fear, anxiety. But in the dream, when I'm thinking of I shift conscious, you know, in one state of mind, and then I, I say, right. Does that? Actually, on the T, you, all you want is the symbols and the meaning. And then if you have anything else, put it at the bottom of the dream. Okay. Like, shift, like shifting. When we shift in a dream and we go from here to there, we start jumping around. All that is is we're shifting focus or consciousness in the dream. So the laser beam shifts to a different reality. We have the ability to do that. Okay. Yeah. Would the uh, uh, U methods also work for, for health issues? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, it, just before you go to sleep, think about what you want to know. Sometimes write it down, it helps, and you will have a dream relating to what the health problem is and what the solution is. We have one here? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the connection between dream state and waking state. Yes. Uh, can you explain then things like coincidences? Uh, you may have not, you, you think of someone that you haven't talked to in 20 years, and the next thing you know, they're emailing you or right. you're, you're seeing them on the street or something. Right. I was just talking to Jim and I were having a conversation about synchronicities and coincidence. And it's all one system. Here it is. It's a triangle. Are you with me? Dream, coincidence, synchronicity, serendipity, whatever you want to call it. Intuition. You have a gut feeling. Sometimes you're heading toward the phone and there it is. You haven't talked to, to Bill or Jane in five years. You knew it was them. And you go, how did I know that? It's, it's all connected. And... When we think about something, when we think about something, suddenly we'll get a synchronicity or coincidence. We are the ones who have triggered it. In other words, it's an interactive universe, quantum teaches. When we think about it, the electromagnetic field goes out. It brings a synchronicity or coincidence to us for us to interpret it. And then based on how much emotion and feeling we put into it, more synchronicities start popping up. Yeah. I had uh, dreams of falling. What, what does that refer to? Coming back into the body. When we're falling, we're actually coming from the other state of consciousness, altered state of consciousness of dreaming, coming back into the, into the physical body. Okay. Yes. Oh. Um, how different could be when we are wandering or dreaming during the day awake? How useful can it be to track those dreams also? Very useful. We'll go back to the we'll go back to the quantum uh, example. Everything is everything is connected, and not, everything is not just connected. Everything is only one moment. There is no past, present, or future. Because people say, "How do you dream in the future?" There is no future. It's one quantum moment. We know this. That's not speculation. During the day, when we're aware of things and see synchron synchronicities, and we dream, daydream, mm -hmm. we're consciously creating our reality. So we are it, really. We cause the dreams in, in many ways, and we cause the synchronicities, and we go where our focus or, or consciousness takes us. One back here? Yeah. Uh, what, is, what is the definition of the word quantum for you? You've been throwing that word around. You've been throwing that word around, so what's the definition of it? Quantum, quantum for me is, is simply uh, particle physics, and it's the, it's the world of the, the extremely small that really gives us insight to how this reality, the larger reality, is created. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, Jim, journal. Go ahead. Yeah, I've read several books. I've read one of your books. I, I don't know if it's your book. But you talk about the journal before. And in one of those books, it's uh, constructing the journal with the date, uh, things in there, uh, and then you know referring it to it. Right. Like the journal is very important how you, you, you construct it. So then you can use it as a reference, like you said right. earlier. And Edgar Casey, went to Edgar Casey Museum. There was a guy talking about Edgar Casey had a gift, right. and dreams and meditation. Right. Well, it could never be like Edgar Casey, but is there a parallel like, like he was talking about back then? Yes, it, it all ties together, and thanks for bringing up the journal. 
the journal is part of green tracking, and, and it's not just journaling. I used to be a skeptic. I did not journal because I thought I'll remember it. And you know, journal is for whoever. What I found with journaling is it's a uh, it's a law of physics once again. When we have a dream, it's of another state of consciousness, altered state of consciousness. How do we ground? We have to ground it here, just like your electricity. It can be at the pole. It's not doing us any good until it comes into the house and it's hooked up and you plug into it. Dreams are the same way. When we write them down in the journal, it grounds that reality here. And then when we go back and review it in a journal, we're able to see that state of consciousness there because when we read it, guess what it does? It reignites that vibration. It takes us right back to that point. I've had dreams that when I go back and read them, I go back to that state of consciousness. And I cannot hold that state of consciousness here, but when I see it in a journal, it allows me to go back instantly. Two, oh, two fast questions. Can you recommend a good, simple book to explain quantum physics? Because I tried many times and I can never stick with it. The other question is, what is the name of the subatomic particle that when it's separated, it can be put in a thousand miles in two directions and it continues to communicate. Photon. That's the subatomic particles of photon, which is a, a particle of light. And that's how they found out that everything is connected. It's not speculation. That when they measure one photon, they found out that the other photon, a thousand miles away, or a thousand light years away, knows instantly. And it, at that point, they were freaked out because they said, it violates the, the, the law of physics, the speed of light which is the speed limit for the universe, according to Einstein. However, what they didn't consider is, if everything's connected, you know, when I hit my toe, I'm going to feel it. So everything is one huge body. That's a photon of light. And as far as a good quantum book, um, the, I uh, can't think of the name of the Something Universe. And, then, and there's one by a fellow by the name of Green, G-R-E-E-N-E. If you pull up green under quantum physicist, he's got a few books also. Yeah, the elegant universe, thank you. Elegant universe. It's very, very well written for the layperson. One back here? Yeah. Um, is your chanting of is your chanting of Q uh, related to the Buddhist chanting of Aum and even the Christian Amen? Yes, I, and do whatever is comfortable for you. And Hugh, uh, Allah, Allah, Hallelujah, which was originally Allah Hugh, Allah Hugh, um, and it goes way back. And I used to chant Um and studied with the Sikhs, lived at the ashrams, taught Kundalini Yoga, and I try A E I O U Um, all the Buddhist chants. And I took the best and left the rest, and I found what works the quickest, the shortcut, is the hue is such a high, fine vibration that it's, that it's absolutely miraculous. I've seen healings, physical healings, mental healings, spiritual healings. Simply, we uh, did a workshop in Austin years ago, and we're in a grocery store, and I heard this, this lady yelling, Sebastian, Sebastian. I didn't know who it was. She was just a member of a workshop. We give them the hue. And she said, I just want to thank you guys. I've been hewing every day for two years. And she burst into tears. And she said, my life has changed. Oh my God, from one end to the other. I can't tell you. And it was that love. And the tears start flowing and the cold starts crying. We had a big love fest there in the uh, grocery store. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hello there, Michael. Hello. I just wanted to ask you uh, the question about a recurring dream or the same dream that was so beautiful. I was back as a child. The house that I lived in uh, in the 30s and 40s, and everyone there, uh, they were all there, my whole family. And it was so beautiful that when I woke up, I just put myself back to sleep and went right back to it. <laughs> I wondered what it could mean because most of them were dead. Yeah. But they were still alive. I just went back to them and 
visit it. Right. it, it how could that be so? That's what I tried to do with the hot girl drink too. But it didn't work. Uh, we call that um, in our book. We call it connecting dreams, and we connect. We literally connect with deceased loved ones, um, and it's it's a, it's a bond of love. In other words, the bond of love supersedes uh, death as we know it. And I often have connecting dreams with my uh, animals. My animals will come back to see me. And it's so real. When I wake up, sometimes I, I reach out to, to pet the animal. Somebody else? Uh, yeah. I'd like to uh, compliment you on a very comprehensive presentation and ask how, uh, how do you fit in Jung's belief that everything in our dream is actually us, is a part of us? It's explained best. Uh, Jung was on it. I mean, you know, he's, he was so far beyond Freud, Adler, Gestalt, all the other people that had he had quantum physics, he would have, he was my role model for the longest, longest period of time. And quantum went on to explain Jung's theory of how every, everything is part of us. You know, the old, uh, the, the saying, the, the world in a grain of sand, the poetic saying, and we think it's uh, figurative. No, no. It's literal. If we had the technology today, we could see the whole universe in that grain of sand. And quantum has gone on to say that the universe is really holographic. It's a hologram. Everything is part of everything else. So <clears throat> when you go to gnosis, how to know something, rather than look outside, look within. The old saying, if we don't go within, we go without. Everything is within us. The whole world, all the answers. The moment we ask the question, the answer is really already there. Uh, do you feel that uh, when you're in an altered state of consciousness or when you're meditating, that uh, the individual can affect changes, you know, spiritual healing, physical healing changes? For themselves? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. As, when we go into that altered state of consciousness or that higher, finer vibration, and uh, we did a workshop in L.A., and we must have hewed for 15 minutes. And it wasn't meant that way, because there were 40-some people who weren't familiar with the hue. And it rolled that way. And there was a guy who was about 35. When he walked in the front door, he had three broken ribs, broken arm. And he's, he's kind of like this. And he was really hurting. I said, what happened to you, bro? And he goes, I, was, I took the DMV from motorcycle yesterday, hit the wall at 30, lost control, broke my ribs. I said, you sure you want to be here? I said, it's going to be like 90 minutes. He goes, yeah, I need to be here. I said, all right. We hewed. After the hue, 15 minutes hue, it was really strange because it was the highest, finest vibration that I felt in as long as I remember. I had to hold on to something. I, I walked over to somebody else. I said, did you feel that? They went, oh, my God. I walked over. This guy stood up. He couldn't even stand. He goes, I'm healed. <laughs> and, and I'm a skeptic. And I, did, I went, I went over to him, and no, he couldn't even walk before that. And that vibration, that meditation, that frequency had changed so much that he had a healing. Anyway, yeah, anybody else? Good, okay. Uh, are there differences between your dream theories and shamanic journaling? They overlay, pretty much the same. And they do the same thing. And every, all the Native American cultures, all the shamans, uh, they go way back and they pretty much recommend the same thing. That as we get familiar with our dreams, basically our whole state of consciousness changes and our life changes. Yeah? Uh, you have kind of answered my question already, but I was wondering what would be the average time you would do this each night when you went to sleep? The you. The you? Um, I would recommend, before I go to sleep, I usually hew for three, maybe three to five minutes. But personally, I, I hew every day for 20 minutes. It's my um, meditation, my contemplation, we call it. Um, but you can do whatever is comfortable with you. Anywhere from one to 20 minutes usually does it. Please stay. What can you say about the difference between uh, destiny and consciously affecting your future? For me, I mean, this is, you know, an open area of speculation. Destiny, 
is what we're dealt. The hand we're dealt, just like playing poker. Some of the, you know, I've won $35,000 in one hand on a pair of deuces. I used to be a professional poker player for 17 years. And uh, put myself through school, undergraduate, graduate. Um, and I've lost more money than I can tell you on the best hands ever ever dealt. So it's, it's what's dealt to us is destiny, and then what we do with it, what we consciously do with it, painting our canvas is, is really the other part of the equation that lets us get, get creative with it. Because I've met people that seem like they had no hand at all, and that they are, they've done so much with their life. It's just the marble, yeah.